up, everybody? We're here at the Artisan Podcast. I got my main man, Jalen, on the vibes, a.k.a. Jalen Baker, a.k.a. Houston's Finest, a.k.a. Houston to go, a.k.a. Houston in 11. Uh, <laughs> uh, just for the record, I said that Houston was going to lose to Golden State in like five games, and he vehemently disagreed with me. And they almost won. So would have won if Chris Paul didn't get I mean, hurt. maybe. That's, that's, that's it's a, a real fact. possibility. It's, it's a fact. It, it's a real possibility. But we'll never know. Because, you know, James Harden is soft when in, in clutch situations this and Chris is, Paul got hurt even, again. This isn't even about this. It don't matter, but I just want this on wax. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> right. All right. We're, on, we're still out on vacation. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Jalen is a vibraphonist and multi-instrumentalist. I can say that word. Uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist and uh, he plays a variety of styles. He just got his undergrad at Columbia College and now he's attending Florida State University. While he's getting his masses, and they paying him for it, so good looking out at FSU. Now, in the course of time, you have just done like a residency at the at Ravinia Festival Space, which is a great space. I was a part of Ravinia as a uh, as a high schooler. Mm-hmm. Their jazz scholars program, learned from with some really great cats. But this was a little bit different. So I know you spent eight days and eight nights there. Tell us about the whole process. All right, so they selected 15, I guess, undergraduate or graduate students. True. And I, the basis of the program was to compose, I guess. Mm-hmm. So they really wanted us to write something while we were there, right. not necessarily to bring in something that we've already finished. Right. To write something there or to finish something that hadn't been finished mm-hmm. during our time there. True. And it, it was a... Interesting experience. Got to work with uh, Rufus Reed, Billy Childs, and Tim Hagens, uh, three very successful just musicians, jazz right. musicians. All of them do all kinds of stuff. But and they kill themselves. So yeah, know. yeah. So you know, we played um, every day, like two or two three hour rehearsals twice a day for right. about a week. Um, constantly bringing in new charts, mm-hmm. editing. That kind of thing, and then at the end of the week, there was a concert where everyone, I guess, premiered a new piece. I think right. every single person actually wrote something. New. I think they did. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, was that an intimidating experience for you? I mean, obviously, you knew some of the people there, so that takes away. You know, that makes things a little bit more familiar. It makes things kind of more. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. It just you know, adds some familiarity to the situation. But when you going there you didn't know who was going to be there necessarily mm-hmm. uh did you feel like oh man i gotta bring my best chops or whatever like how'd you feel about that i mean i always just kind of feel like you should you know give 110 percent right generally so i'm a pretty confident person i was going to say that i didn't want to so, say it but yeah you definitely are yeah um you know not trying to be better than anybody or anything mm-hmm. but i do have a lot of confidence in the amount of work that i've put in so For sure. I try not to put too much pressure on myself mm-hmm. to, you know, to sound better than other people or right. whatever, do anything. I just kind of try to approach it like any other type of gig or performance. Right. I guess the most intimidating thing would be playing in front of people like Rufus Reed or Billy right. Childs. No not, not so much playing with my peers because, right. you know, right. we're right. all going for the same thing. So mm-hmm. there's no point in, you know making yourself uncomfortable around people who are like-minded you know no doubt. if anything it should make you excited mm-hmm. yeah everybody you know I mean, we were just talking about sports but everybody doesn't respond to uh pressure or like competition the same way you know mm-hmm. if that i mean that was it wasn't a competitive environment you all were all there to learn as you said mm-hmm. but at the same time being in a, a new space with some people who you don't know who were you know, a lot of them, you know, were killing. Mm-hmm. In fact, all of them were killing. There wasn't really one person there who I thought, oh, man, that person needs some serious work. They they were all really, really playing. And big shout to them. Big shout to all the individuals that got on stage and really put the work in over, you know, before they even got there. You know, you don't get there and all of a sudden you become a jazz musician. It takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hella reps and playing in front of a lot of different crowds and making mistakes on stage and, you know, taking a lot of chances to be able to get to that point. So, you know, uh, to all the performers who were there, you guys did a really great job. I got to spend some time with you after the show. They were all super chill, you know, which made me happy, you know. Mm-hmm. It was just a good hang, you yeah. know, <laughs> even the extracurricular activities. It was all it was all great, man. But, um, 
you got, like you said, you guys learn from Billy Childs and uh, Rufus Reeds, who are basically living legends. Yeah. You know, um, what was it like having people who have so much more experience than you and played with so many big names uh, there, like learning from them directly? Yeah, it's it's enlightening. You mm -hmm. know, um, there's a lot of knowledge between uh, the three uh, overseers, I guess. Right. Um, Tim Hagen's included, so a trumpet mm -hmm. player. And I guess the biggest thing we can do is improve our perspective. And sure, all three of those guys are great, but all three of those guys think differently. No doubt. So trying to get a little bit from each one mm -hmm. and take it with you, I think, was the most, it was at least the most important thing for me. Okay. Just to, you know, they all approach things differently. So for sure. all of those things could... Um, What's the word? Go into how I I go about approaching things in the right. future. Now I can dig it, man. You know, it's uh perspective is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's very rare that you can just go through life unless you're living in a vacuum. You know, mm -hmm. and you get to have the same mindset, or you're around all people who think exactly the same. There are some benefits to that. You know, like being around like-minded people. You a lot of times have the ability to. Uh, get places quickly, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, we're all pulling in the exact same right direction. We all have the same mindset, you know, using another sports analogy, you know, we're all moving towards the same goal. The goal is the championship. So I'm going to do whatever I got to do to do that. Yeah. But in this, you know, music game or just with life in general, any entertainment, anything, you know, oftentimes we are in a vacuum. We have to go and work with other people who may speak, a different language than us that may uh, have a totally different background. Uh, culturally, they're very different. Um, they listen to different types of music. You know, like they're everybody's going to bring a very, very, very different skill set, and we have to learn to be able to like amalgamate ourselves to uh, you know people's personalities. You know, and that's a very valuable skill set to have. Bringing people together and being there to make great music, man. It's, yeah. You know, y'all were able to do that, and y'all had a. Uh, not too diverse of an age range, but y'all had a decent little uh, age range in a group, right? Yeah. It went from like 19, 19 to, to what? 28. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of life experience in that. Yeah. Within that uh, time frame. What did you get from the uh, other, uh, I don't want to call them students, man. Just the other camp members, let's just call them that. Your peers, rather. <laughs> I mean, yeah. since everybody was coming from a different place, mm -hmm. actually like half of the camp came from the same school as me. Right. But... Big shout out to you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Besides those guys, you know, depending on where you are, you're going to play a, a little differently. Right. So just kind of like seeing what everyone's hearing, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. you can really tell what someone's hearing by what they're writing. And no doubt. The uniqueness of people's music is, mm -hmm. um, it helps me because it gives me ideas. You know, person from L.A. is going to write probably a little different from someone from New Hampshire or from Tallahassee. Right. So it's interesting to see how people are going about um, just getting out what they're hearing. You know? Right. And everyone thinks they listen to a lot of music, but there's a lot of music that most people haven't heard. So, right. you know, people showing me things and I'm like, oh, you know, it might be some folk pop music, I don't know. Right. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's something I've never yeah, heard. And for sure, for sure. That's probably contributing to what's coming out in their playing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, that was my biggest thing. I try not to, you know, hover over people and ask them a bunch of right. questions. I just kind of want to see how they interact naturally and organically. No and no I doubt. think I tend to observe that well and digest it. Mm -hmm. So. I can dig that. So, in addition to seeing just how in general how people operate, hearing what they're hearing, just as far as uh, their approach to improvisation, their approach to uh, maybe more specifically how they approach two five ones, maybe mm -hmm. or you know how they uh, go about just like holding their horn or like you know yeah. playing with others, like so stuff like that was really. I mean, you've you've played with a lot of different cats, but this probably just further reinforced it, I guess, because. You know, you're at FSU now. 
and you were at Houston before, and you were in Chicago before that, and before that you were in Houston. Mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, you used to interacting with people who've been in Houston, and then you get here to Chicago, and you're interacting with people here in Chicago. Yeah. And obviously you're at FSU now, and there's a culture there, you know, you all do a certain thing. Mm-hmm. Again, once again, you just throw a bunch of different people in a room, and it's like, oh, you know, they do, we all kind of function in a little bit differently yeah. in this space. Oh, that's cool, man. That's good. I think that's good for everybody. I think it's good for all of us, man. When you force diversity on people, it forces you to uh, open your eyes, man. You know. Yeah, be careful. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, you know what? I, I don't mind saying, man. You know, I think, um, I think. Well, what do they say? Uh, 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 um, um, what they say? Travel is the enemy of like. Ignorance, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, you're relatively well traveled, but all those people were coming from great distances, mm-hmm. and you all ended up in the same spot. And they brought their, they brought their lingo, they brought their jazz knowledge, they brought their cultural isms all mm-hmm. to the same place. So maybe you didn't go to where they were, but they brought a little piece of that yeah, with them, you know. Sure. And it's one thing you kind of learn in college, like man, you've been around, especially being at an art school, yeah. you know. People come with different shit all the time, you know, yeah. and you can't just be like, nah, man, fuck that, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah, that's not, that's not, that's not how we got to function, man, and people, once again, want to live in a vacuum where it becomes this, like, echo chamber of you doing whatever it is that you do, and you only want to do that thing, then fine, go move where that is and be stifled, you know, yes. but if you want to be around other folks, man, you know, you got to learn how to deal, man, yeah. you know, don't be a dick. So I feel comfortable saying I feel comfortable <laughs> saying that. Like, just don't, just don't do it. Um, uh, you, is there anything you want to say about your education thus far? I mean, you're halfway through your master's program now, and I'm sure there. Hopefully, there's a lot of people looking at this and thinking, "Oh man, I'm looking at music school as a possibility," mm-hmm. or I'm getting ready to finish up my undergrad. I want to move into, you know, my secondary education. You know, postgraduate education. What what are your thoughts and feelings about uh, your own education, uh, your goals as far as education, what we take from education as you know creative people? Just you know your thoughts on it in general. Yeah, well, I've gone to performing arts school since the sixth grade, mm-hmm. and so middle school, high school was an art school. Right. Columbia undergrad was an art school. FSU is actually the first real school I think I've ever been to in my life. Real school. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> football sure. team and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, but they all kind of operate about the same. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone wants to, I mean, I guess the biggest difference between, let's say, Columbia and FSU is that there's actually probably no difference at all besides yeah. the number of music students, I guess, sure. at a time. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot more. Well, there's more genres than Columbia. Columbia is more of a temporary um, music school. Mm-hmm. FSU has everything, you know, mm-hmm. has chamber music, uh, orchestras, yada, yada, piano. Right, 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 right. good stuff. Um, but I guess music education has, I can't say it hasn't helped me. You know, mm-hmm. some people might some people have different opinions on it and sure. where it's going but I guess the thing that school does for most people generally is to teach you a work ethic that you're that's real not necessarily going to get by just taking a job right out right. of high school or whatever right and no one really wants to accept that that's what school is doing like right. we go into school thinking that we're going to learn all of this cool stuff but in actuality it's really just kind of teaching you to do stuff that you don't want to do Right. Or teaching you the patience to do right. things that right, you don't right, want to right, do. Right, 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 And that helps me as, like, a performer and composer. More so a composer is that, like, you don't start something one day and finish it necessarily. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you will, but more times than not, it's a long, it's a drawn-out process. Right. Much like school, you know. Yeah, so for sure. It kind of, having gone to undergrad and currently doing master's work, I've gotten pretty used to not finish, seeing the finished product immediately. Right. Because that's not necessarily how the real world works. Right, you know, right, right, right. Everyone wants right. to, in a perfect world, we, you know, we want to s- start and see the finish line, like, mm-hmm. 100 meters down, but it's not really how it goes. It's a, right. it's a marathon, you no know. Doubt. And no doubt. school, for anybody who's 
think you're contemplating music school. It's what you put into it, you know. Like, I think I got the best experience I could have gotten while I was at Columbia, and I'm, I'm enjoying my current experience at FSU. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily because anybody handed it to me, you know. Right. And if that's what you think is gonna, some people are lucky enough to where you know the cards kind of fall in the place just by chance, but. Me, I kind of had to, just given the weird instrument that I play, um, I kind of had to be a little bit more proactive and set things up for myself and make the experience what I wanted it to be. Right. Because, you know, you get there's a ton of musicians in Chicago, um, you get lost in the shuffle very quickly. Definitely. And, you know, no one's trying to, no one's handing anybody gigs just because. Right. So, music school, you know. If you're gonna do it, you gotta do it. Right. You can't just show up and expect um, for it to be easy or for it to be necessary. Like school isn't fun, you know. Mm -hmm. Parts of it are fun, but the overall process is—it's a process. Right. And the process is never generally that fun, mm -hmm. you know. But I'd do it again, you know, if I had to. For sure. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not saying I would go back right. after my graduate right. studies, but. I'm thankful for the experiences that I've been able to get and the professors who invested in me mm -hmm. in some way. For sure, man. You know, um, I watch a lot of different interviews. I listen to a lot of different people speak, man. And generally, the people who are most successful echo a lot of the same things that you just said. I echo a lot of the same things that you said, man. It's, it's, they, they go in, they work hard, you know, they put a plan in place for themselves, and they do their best to execute that plan. And, you know, I tend to want to agree with you uh, for the most part in that school is going to be what you get out of it. Mm -hmm. Generally, if you're at a major university, college, you know, conservatory, the people you're learning from at some point were everyday working professionals. Mm -hmm. If they're, if if not even still people who are active in their field, still, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a wealth of knowledge that you don't have generally as a 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, or even if you're transferring somebody somewhere else for like a, like a, like I said, for a, for a graduate degree, they've been there, done that, you know, 50 to 100 to potentially, depending on who's at your school, to a thousand times, you know. Yeah. They just have, they just have the reps. And you have to go seek these people out. They're, a lot of times, unless they really see something in you, yeah. you know, uh, where they pull you aside and say, hey man, I want you to come by the office. You know, but that's usually only after you've went and put in the work, you know. Yeah. Maybe they've seen you seek somebody else out and somebody directed you to them or them to you or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, a lot of what we do has to be just this self-starter thing. You just got to get up and go and do it, man. Yeah. Because sometimes opportunity will present itself. It's not even really like a knocking thing, you know. Like, you know, that implies like, hey, somebody came looking for you, you know, but... Opportunity will be there if you allow yourself to be in a position or in the places where, you know, uh, opportunity is, man. Yeah. And that usually only happens after you've put in the work, which school gives you the opportunity. It gives you the safe space, so to yeah, speak, to, exactly. you know, get better and make all the mistakes. You know, play all the wrong notes in the practice room, you know, that type of thing. Um, you've also taken on some role as a teacher now, you know. I, so I know you're, like, dealing with students. Mm -hmm. How has your perspective shifted as a student by being a teacher? You know, what what have you, th what were your previous, you know, uh, thoughts and feelings about, you know, teachers that may have shifted now? Huh. Yeah, so I guess the, at FSU I teach an improv class for non-majors, so people who aren't who probably haven't really played jazz. Most of the time they play like a string instrument, like right. my violin, cello, harp, mm -hmm. and a harp student. Right. Um, and the interesting thing about that class is that you don't really know something if you can't explain it to someone. Right. More times than not. Sometimes that said person might just not get it. But mm -hmm. if you're not able to explain something 10 different ways to right. get that student to understand, mm -hmm. you probably don't know it as well as you think you do. Right. And that's probably, I'm sure most teachers would probably admit that to some extent. They sure. probably admit that. And, you know, it's kind of hard to swallow. It's like, huh, you know, I thought I knew this. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I, I thought right. I knew 
what this sounded like mm-hmm. or what this meant, but I can't really put it into words. For sure. And I guess as musicians, sometimes after you've been doing doing it for a while, or just artists in general, right? Like if things come naturally, you take for granted like the process of having learned it. Sure. And everyone's process is a lot differently. Mm-hmm. Like I started off as a more classical musician all the way through high school for the right. most part up until like my senior year. Mm-hmm. So. I relate to my students at FSU pretty well because it's not that far off for me. Sure. And those guys are playing classical music, most of them, classical or new music, and it's 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 not far off from jazz. So like I try to um, bridge the gap in some way and connect mm-hmm. it back to something that they already do. You right. know, like conventional uh, theory that we teach in schools is the basis for jazz theory. It's not quite as in-depth, but, you know, a triad is the same in any genre of right. music, you know? So, and the way that people approach playing over it is going to be very similar, right. regardless of if it's pop music, jazz, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, I try and just get across to them that music is music, it's sound. Sound doesn't necessarily change, mm-hmm. you know? There's nothing really all that different between, besides the improvisational aspect of jazz, but there's not too much different between classical and jazz sonically. Right. You know, jazz is more dissonant, I guess. But, right. You know, 20th century classical music is pretty dissonant. Right. Dissonant, like WC is, you know, pretty similar to a lot of yeah, jazz man. harmony, you know. Definitely. And a lot of the Russian composers have the, have really intense rhythmic aspects to their music mm-hmm. just like jazz comes from you know that African tradition right those aren't too far apart you know mm-hmm. and that's what I feel like intimidates people when we're playing different genres of music it's like oh, I've never done this before um, I don't know how to I don't know how to improvise or whatever but honestly if you played a Bach chorale or Bach sonata over some jazz chord changes at a gig People probably be like, "Man, you sound great." That was killer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was killer. Yeah, you know, chords and whatnot. They tension mm-hmm. and release is the same in most genres of music. Yeah, you know, five chords go to one. Right, they do, man. <laughs> so, and it's it's a lot simpler than um, what we what what it sounds like. For sure. And I, I really try and simplify that class when I'm teaching because. In school, we get beat over the head with a lot of things at a once, and mm-hmm. it just makes it feel complicated. Right. And I try to, I just try and make them feel comfortable enough to make mistakes or whatever. Sure. And, you know, with a lot of the students, they get so caught up in, you know, I got to play the right notes or whatever, in my experience with my class, and even me <laughs> when I'm practicing, right. you know, so I got to play the right notes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just relax and probably play less. <laughs> right, right, and it it works out every. I've taught the class for two semesters now, and the first day of class and the last day of class is always night and day. Right. So, right. and I don't necessarily think that's a result of my incredible teaching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I think it's just people starting to stop boxing themselves in, uh, well, boxing their ears in, really, right, and just kind of playing, right, and. It's interesting to see how how quickly people will pick up, musicians will pick up on things. Because mm-hmm. I've always, always think uh, music is pretty intuitive. That's why. Sure. We have the whole DIY scene, people making right. making music, whole albums on cell phones and whatnot. Yeah, man, shit crazy. It's like, it's hard because we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because we make it hard. Right, right, right. Because it's just like this super like left brain or right brain thing. And, you know, anybody... To me, anybody can do it. You just got to figure out where you fit in. Everybody's mm-hmm. not going to play drums. You know? Right, right. Everyone's not going to sing. Mm-hmm. Um, some people might make beats or whatever. And it it's it's just like, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is we overthink a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I guess just music, music school makes us overthink it. And to a certain extent, we have to overthink things sometimes to just kind of push ourselves. Right. But when you're trying to do something new, which is, I guess, the class I'm teaching, people who haven't done this before, you just kind of got to relax and clear your brain and not try and, like, feel as though you are you got to be incredible right now. Right. You know, you just got to do it. 
Yeah, man, you said a lot of dope stuff. And we're going to get to that right after this little break. <laughs> <laughs> Jalen on the vibes, back in the building, aka Jalen Baker, aka Houston the Great, uh, <laughs> aka Houston in eleven. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, so we did, we left off talking about uh, the teaching aspect of music, and uh, just to throw my little two cent in there, um, I find that teaching is more or less about guiding, finding creative ways to guiding people towards the answers and not necessarily telling them what they are, man. Because yeah. um, you're right, man. The worst teachers in the world I ever had, for me personally, when it was like, no, it's this way. And they teach it this way, you know. And it's just so rigid, man. It's like, the, these are the answers, you know. And with, you know, with creative people or when you're dealing with the arts, you know, there is no one, there is no one path to, um, Sound, especially Western music. I mean, there's yeah. only 12 goddamn notes. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's only so many rhythms you can have, you know, well, usable rhythms you can have. You know, there's only so many different chords and chord, chordal extensions you can have. You know, I mean, most of this stuff is, you know, dominant, predominant, and tonic. That's what a lot of this is, you know, and little iterations of it and, you yeah. know, little, uh, little, you know, I don't know. It's all the same. Yeah. That's basically what it is. Like you said, and you, you articulated that very well. A lot of this stuff is just, hey, man, Bach was playing a lot of the stuff that Oscar Peterson was playing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you really get down to it, man. You know, they're not playing any different notes than what you have access to. They just maybe do it um, more creatively because they put the work in and found ways to make themselves sound that they, the way that they want to sound. Um <clears throat> You and I both listen to jazz, but we have very different approaches to the music. Mm -hmm. um, and my, write, my writing is different than your, your writing. My playing is different than your playing. How you use a lot of, uh, I don't want to say odd meter stuff, because your, your stuff is not that odd meter, you know what I mean? But you'll switch meter, and you'll find very creative ways to funk things up for the lack of a better term. You know what I'm saying? Like me writing a piece in 4-4 four, four, that's jazz using the exact same chord changes is going to be very different than a piece that you write. And when I went and saw you this past Saturday at the, you know, at the Ravinia thing, uh, what what was the official name for that anyway? So we'll make sure we give them that oh, proper Oh, Stains duty. Music Music Institute. Okay. Boom. That. Right. Uh, <laughs> The first thing I said to Drew when uh, we were there, I was like, that was such a Jalen piece. You know what I mean? Like, you have you have your unique sound. You have your unique approach to music. Uh, when did you start to realize that your approach to music was different than the other vibe opponents or maybe the uh, other cats? And what were some of the things that led you down this path? I don't think it's too different. Um, I think I'm a product of what I probably listen to too much. Okay. <laughs> I did that. Um, but I do try and I know I, I'm aware of how I sound mm -hmm. and I know what I'm going to generally sound good doing. Right. You know, um, not, to, not to say I don't try things. Right. Uh, I try a lot of things. Right. Know, I just never hear them. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, but whenever I hear you play, you sound good. Okay. So that means you're doing different shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I guess, I, I don't, well, I guess the fact that I don't listen to a ton of vibraphone players mm -hmm. probably helps me, um, in a sense. Like, I don't, there's probably, like, 
four, maybe five guys that I really listen to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, probably out of those five guys, probably like two <laughs> that right. I really, really listen mm -hmm. to. Who are? Um, Stephon Harris and Milt Jackson are probably the two I listen True. to the most with. Bobby Hutcherson and Warren Wolf coming in with a close third and fourth. Right. Not talent-wise. Right, just, right, 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 right. I just listen to Milton and Stefan a lot mm -hmm. at Nazi. <laughs> so, and, but none of my music really sounds like them, I guess. It's right. interesting. Stefan, one of the homies, by the way. Yeah. Like, Shout out to Stefan Harris. Definitely, man. <laughs> Doing a lot of things for uh, education. Yeah. Just in general. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but what was the question again? How did you get to like your sound oh. development? What, what were those things that attributed? Oh, to? okay. So I guess playing classical music for a decent amount of time at a pretty decent level um, definitely influenced how I go about writing things because I I like to use a lot of sections, mm -hmm. not a ton, but I don't. I've never been a big fan. I love jazz standards, but I've never right. been a big fan of like. You know, uh, head solos, head type of thing. I dig, yeah. And some of my music is like that, but I like, you know, multiple melodies. I like when mm -hmm. people, let's say it's a quintet, I like when there's, when the two lead instrument players are playing over different sets of changes. So mm -hmm. one person will blow over this set of changes and will move forward. Right. And, you know, I'm still trying to get good at it. Like Billy Childs, who was at the Staines Institute, is someone who's incredibly creative when mm -hmm. doing things like that. He was talking about that all week, of uh, thinking more asymmetrically. And um, it's funny, like one of my tunes that I play a lot has like three or so sections. And I stopped adding stuff to that because I was like, all right, you know, I don't want to do too, too much. Because right. people, it has to be listenable. Right. And um, we read it in, in one of the classes and Billy was like, <laughs> was like, yeah, man, you know, you could go a, go a lot further with this, right, right, this idea right, right. right here. And I was like, okay, well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that type of thing is incredible for people to just be a pull ideas out of their minds mm -hmm. at command, you know, on right. command. So I guess that's the biggest thing with my writing is trying to, you know, break, um, not make it symmetrical. Right. Have things that are happening constantly mm -hmm. that are adding to the piece, like um, modern jazz quartet, um, John Lewis's writing, uh, pianists, if people aren't hip to John Lewis, um, he wrote a lot of um, like through composed pieces, I guess, not right. quite through composed, but pretty close, like uh, Django um, is a great tune where, you know, you hear a melody, like rubato melody, and then they go into blowing changes that almost don't resemble that at all, what right. you heard the intro at doesn't resemble it too much. And like uh, two bass hit that Miles recorded, mm -hmm. which was written by John Lewis, I believe. Don't quote me. Pretty uh, two bass? Uh, yeah. Didn't Dizzy write something like called I know he wrote something called one bass hit. Yeah. Uh we're gonna look it up. Uh, yeah. We're gonna look it up. We're gonna look it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, stuff like that um, has always been um, interesting for me to listen to. Gerald Clayton, great mm -hmm. pianist, um, Ambrose, like those guys writing is probably what I listen to the most for composition, sure, because it's always moving forward. Mm -hmm. Like you don't hear too much recycled material, right? And I think that keeps listeners engaged, assuming mm -hmm. the listener wants to listen, right? And you know, you don't want to be super predictable. And I guess the thing with odd meters, it's very rare that I'm really trying to write in an odd meter. Mm -hmm. I just start playing something. I guess this is my process. I'll right. start playing something. And I'll realize that I have shorted a beat or, or mm, so. Okay. And then I'm like, okay, well, as long my thing is, as long as it feels good, right. I can write in that meter. Like, okay. if it's all wonky and whatnot, I'm not a huge fan of uh, of playing that stuff. I like listening to the, right. wonk, to the wonky stuff right, because right, it's right. like something that I don't, that I can't necessarily do. But most, most of my odd meter stuff is pretty intuitive to me like I feel yeah. like you could dance to it yeah man it's funky man it, it definitely grooves yeah for and sure man so I'm never 
the person to try and write something to trip up somebody else. Mm-hmm. Every now and then, because you got to keep musicians uh, humble. We'll get lazy. Yeah, because yeah. you know, <laughs> no no, no, nobody, no really, nobody really wants to practice your music. Right. So right. you might have to add something tricky in there mm-hmm. just to ensure that they look at it before they show up at no the doubt. gig, because nobody wants to look stupid. Right, of and, course. You know, Musicians will turn around and look at you in a second. Yeah, they will. So, you know, every, every now and then I might add in some sure. like a like a weird line that you mm-hmm. might have to get in your hands, and I think that stuff's great because you don't want to be complacent on stage. Right. And you want people not to zone out because mm-hmm. we all have had moments where we zone out and end up messing the whole thing up. Definitely. You know, it might be something easy. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. So, I mean. I guess that's that's my thing. I listen to people like Ambrose, uh, Duke Ellington, as of recently, and mm-hmm. like some of the um, the sweets he composed are Definitely. kind of what I probably set the tone for what I was uh, what I was alluding to. And I said Gerald Clayton, Ambrose, Duke Ellington, John Lewis. Um, I don't listen to as much classical music nowadays, but I'm sure that contributed. I'm willing to bet. Definitely. Yeah. Percussion music specifically is what I was mostly into. Okay. So. Yeah, I can see where the percussion music influence definitely comes in. I mean, you guys, especially, <clears throat> especially like early on in your development, percussion is a lot of the teaching is about rhythm. Yeah. And it's less focused on melody as opposed to myself. You know, a having kind of got my start singing in the choir at church, and then like you pick up a horn, it's just like these are the notes. Learn how to play this notes, and everything is kind of driven by. It melody, harmony, and, and notes, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I definitely feel that, man. Definitely feel that. Uh, you said something that <clears throat> kind of like triggered a thought that I've been having, uh, which is something that I kind of just decided I wanted to really develop an answer for, if there's even an answer for. But who is music for? You know, <clears throat> and I know that's kind of a philosophical question. You know, it's, it's probably impossible to answer. But... I do want you to try. So let's yeah. <laughs> give, give you a, put your best foot forward. So a lot of times uh, you turn on the radio nine times out of ten, 99% of the time, rather, <laughs> 99 times out of 99% of the time, it's pop music. You know, even if it's some sort of non-popular genre, you know, it's some sort of pop music of that genre, which, you know, is a blessing and a curse all, all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um with that being said, sometimes we compose things for, uh, you know, commercial sale for yeah. the everyday listener, you know, yeah. the guy in his car, the lady at her desk, you know, whatever, the thing for the club, which is which is all well and good, you know. I love being at a place where, where I'm listening to something I haven't heard before by a guy or a guy who I've never heard of, you know, and we're all, everybody in the space gets to enjoy the music. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if that person intentionally wrote it that way, but they went out and they created something that was really for the masses. You know, yeah. just to, for instance, when Pharrell composed Happy, yeah. that song was probably the most popular song in the world for maybe yeah, a months. year. Yeah, 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 yeah honestly, maybe, you know what year, I mean? Yeah. It might have been. I mean, we played it at commencement at, at yeah. several graduations. I mean, you heard it anywhere and everywhere. You know, I've heard it like uh, made into like commercialized commercial versions. Yeah. You know, but it, but it wasn't called that, you know. I don't know if that was his plan when he made that. Mm-hmm. When you create music, do you create music for musicians? Because I've played music like that. You know, you've played music wow. like that. Uh, do you create music for Jalen? Do you create music for whoever your listener is? You don't know who that is right now. Yeah. You know, you're on the come up, and yeah, yeah. people come see exactly. you for sure. But, you know, like, who are you creating music for? Is that even something you think about? Or are you just thinking, well, damn, that was cool. Let me let me develop that. Yeah, I guess as of recently, I've been writing music that's, I guess, goes hand in hand with a lot of things that go on around us, good and bad. You mm-hmm. know, so by that definition, I guess to answer your question, I guess currently I'm writing music to inform. Mm-hmm. You know, so it is for people, but it has to it people have to want to listen, you know, and the tricky thing about that, and I'm sure people like Kendrick Lamar, um, J. Cole, and some others, you know, and a a ton of people, um, the tricky thing about making music like that is that music is, 
inherently like aesthetically pleasing. Right. So it's hard to get people's attention. Well, not to get people's attention. It's hard to get people to listen deeper than the nice sounds. Right. You know what I mean? And that's always that's always the challenge. So I think one thing I try to do, I want to make people as uncomfortable as possible without turning them off mm-hmm. and while they still enjoy what's being played. <clears throat> right. Because music is supposed to, like, you're supposed to enjoy music. I think, like, the question you really ask is, like, who is art for? You know, not even sure. just music. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like, we went to the, I went to the Art Institute yesterday or two days ago and, you know, that stuff is great to look at. And it's great could, to look at, man. You, you could easily just ignore everything that was that was probably supposed to be portrayed in there. And right. just be like, man, that was a really good picture, or that was a really nice sculpture. So, you know, I think there is there's merit to music that's just all fun. Sure. But I guess it's there has to be somewhat of a balance, I guess, because mm-hmm. art has always spoken to what's happening around us good and bad you know right when things are good like you know american music of the 50s when we came out of world war ii and everything was great mm-hmm. was most american music was pretty happy yeah. you know at least on one side of the racial uh construct Definitely. of this country Definitely. well yeah for <laughs> it sure, was like it, it was real happy and yeah. you know it was great you know like elvis and all, all of that stuff is very like johnny cash all that stuff's mm-hmm. real upbeat it's real happy you know people were thriving and then you know on the other side, mm-hmm. things weren't great, and mm-hmm. it sounds like it. Right, <laughs> you right, know, with blues right, and right, whatnot. right. And, and in jazz, you know, Ornette Coleman and that stuff doesn't necessarily sound happy, but I think it's still enjoyable. Mm-hmm. But it's to me, at least, it's even more enjoyable when you're listening to it for what it's supposed to be. Right. You know, you're not just ignoring it and being like, oh, this sounds cool, because, right. you know, I've shown people music, and... That, that has been meaningful, you know, mm-hmm. at least meaningful to me. And they're like, it's like, man, that's a really good song. And I'm right. like, ah, I don't know if that was necessarily the point. Right. You know, it was right. to make a good song or whatever. It might have been to inform or mm-hmm. to get across a, a ideology or, sure. or an emotion or a feeling. Sure. Well, you know what? One thing I've learned watching Colin Kaepernick is that, uh, or anybody, anybody, uh, any piece of music, people are going to hear what they want to hear. Yeah, man. exactly. You know, you you can you can you can you can put it out there, and they're gonna take what they want to take from it, which is fine. You know, but uh, yeah, people want to hear what they want to hear. You can't really control the message once it's out. Mm-hmm. You can do your best. You do a great job. I've obviously seen you play a bunch of times, and uh, especially with your compositions, your original compositions, you'll say what the music was for. Mm-hmm. And once, and at that point, if they stay and decide that they want to listen to this piece. Mm-hmm. You know that you wrote specifically for this event. They are agreeing to sit and deal with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you know they're going to think about it, and they can either think about it from your perspective, or they can think about it from the perspective that they already had. You know, and one thing unique thing about instrumental music is most of the time there is no words. Exactly. Yeah. So you know you have to be real creative about how you're conveying that message. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you know, you know, I think you do a great job at. Um, Stirring up emotion, you know. Yeah, I, I, I do, man. Um, doubling back to the Kaepernick thing and doubling back to, you know, who is art for. You know, uh, the tricky thing I found with pieces that convey a message, you know, in any in any form, any art form, who is art for? That's what you said. Um, people love to change the narrative, man. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a thing because it... You said you want to make people as uncomfortable as possible. And it's almost, that's what a protest is almost. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, Kaepernick with the NFL thing, people want their football, man. People want music, bro. They want music and they want to be able to listen to it without having to think about the other stuff. Because it is is a release and I think it's good to be able to listen to music and get away from the world every now and then. Sure. You know, if that's what you want to do, probably shouldn't listen to X, Y, and Z. You know sure. what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I hear you. Don't listen to Kendrick Lamar if mm-hmm. you want to be lied to. Right. You, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and, you know, that that's a shame because he's such a great artist and he gets his point across and I'm sure there's plenty of people who have been turned off by 
sure, man. him just saying what he feels. And he's not saying anybody's wrong or, like, I think he does a good job. Like, he doesn't necessarily condemn anybody. You know, there, there are a few lines where it's right. very point blank. Right. But that's the shock factor that he has right. to put in the music to, you know, uh, get people's attention. Sure. And, you know, I guess you just have to be mature enough to not be offended. Like, you know, no one's a... Artists are generally pretty sensitive to other people's emotions. Yeah, definitely. So we're gen- or at least I'm, I'm never pointing the finger at anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just speaking to what I've seen, what I may have experienced, and you know, things that are probably pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. You know, and you just got to be mature enough to take it. Right. And it's that that's, I guess I'm in a good situation. Because I'm not writing pop music. Sure. So the demographic of people coming to see me perform is a lot different from the demographic that's going to see uh, any rapper or any singer or Beyonce. Mm-hmm. Like the people who are coming to see me perform are probably looking to hear something a little deeper than, sure. than Definitely. you know, like dance music. Right. And when they want to dance, they will go see, you know, mm-hmm. somebody else who's uh, more into that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm. I'm, like I said, I'm lucky that I'm not having to uh, deal with a, a widespread audience. Like sure. The people who are listening to jazz are probably people who've been listening to jazz for the last 50, 60 years. Right. You know what I mean? There's some there's some given information that's going to come with that. Yeah, it, exactly. And Definitely. it's not new in jazz. It's, right. not, it's not really new in art. It's kind of new in other forms of music that are more recent. You know? Sure. Um, but, you know, it's... I've never had a had trouble getting a getting a point across, and mm-hmm. I'm lucky, and I'm sure maybe at some point I probably I might, but I guess the my my advice for any artist who's trying to put out music that's I guess uh, socially aware, socially conscious, mm-hmm. is to not give people the energy. Give people energy. If people are fighting fighting you against what you're doing, just don't give them right. the energy because it's. It's generally just to deter you, you know? Sure. And obviously, if they're not open to what you're saying, your music was not for them, and mm-hmm. you shouldn't linger on the fact that you didn't connect with that person. You're not going to touch everybody, you know? Right. Only, you know, not even Jesus could touch everybody, yeah, obviously. Definitely. You, you yeah, know what obviously, I mean? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, kill him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it's a, you just got to, yeah. you, you take it. You know, everyone, right. everyone's not going to see things. That's all. That's all. On the artist side, you have to be mature enough to understand that people aren't going to see things the way you see it. Not sure. even the people playing in the right. band with you right. might see it the way you see it. Definitely. And you got to be able to accept that. And I personally don't like always just being in the same room with everyone, with people who only believe what I believe. Right. It makes for a pretty boring conversation. Yeah, the echo know. chamber thing happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I like, I mean, I've been lucky enough to play in some a few different southern cities where you're like sure. the deep south yeah like y'all probably don't even know where Apalachicola is I but heard. exactly yeah. I, I played in savannah um savannah georgia maybe three weeks ago with my professor uh, leon anderson and some other incredible fsu students mm-hmm. and you know we played one of my pieces that's uh it, i guess it could be a touchy subject for people in the south um, but, you know, it was received well. Yeah. And I think if you deliver something in a sincere manner, even if people don't agree with you, they won't blow it off like it's nothing. Sure. And I feel like sometimes our approach to getting a point, to getting our um, our point across can be real, real aggressive. Right. And that's not that's not always, sometimes it has to be, but that's not always the, the best way. Like Martin, Like Dr. King was able to get his point across by being somewhat um, lack of not lack of days cool, but like touchy, like sure. pretty sensitive to what's going right. on, you know. At least in the public eye, mm-hmm. like he he didn't say anything bad about anybody who was doing the wrong thing, right. ever, right. you know. And that helped him. And then on the other side, you know, there are people who were very vocal about the people doing the wrong thing, and that helped them. Yeah. But you know. Well, you know what, man? We need all of it, man. Exactly. We need all of. We need people. Because everybody is not going to listen to Dr. Kenny. Oh man, he, you know, exactly. Because he's easy to ignore because he's exactly. non-confrontational. 
they take somebody like uh, Malcolm X or even somebody like uh, James Baldwin, man, who, you know, was probably one of the most articulate cats you ever want to come across. And he'll reach on our, uh, on a uh, more intellectual level. Then you have, you take a guy like Ali, man, who was a meathead, you know, yeah. boxer guy, uh -huh. but his ability to reach the masses with his platform, being a heavyweight champion in the world, blah, 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 blah. He's able to do those things. Uh, I, I generally want to encourage people to go out and make their statements, whether I agree with them or not. Yeah, because exactly. time has a funny way of dealing with us all. You know, you take a song like, you know, All I Need Is Love by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Or you take a song like What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. Or you take a song like Fuck the Police, you know, with, uh, it, with, with N.W.A., man. And, you know, in the moment, these things are, like, radically controversial. Yeah. I mean, and we there's, there's a hundred other songs we can name, mm -hmm. you know. But those are the first ones that popped in my head, especially What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, you know. Mm -hmm. Or another one. Uh, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud with uh, James okay. Brown. You yeah. know, I mean, these songs sometimes in the moment they're for a very, very specific group of people, yeah. and a lot of times we don't want to listen because you know I don't belong in that group. Maybe you want to be in that group. Maybe you don't like that group. Maybe you think that these people voicing this thing somehow offends you, and it's not you know and um, you know congruent with your uh, 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 a line of thinking, whatever. And, you know, time kind of reveals all and heals all wounds, and it, it sort of speak, you know, uh, you get 30, 40, 50 years away from those songs, and you're like, damn, I see what they were talking about. Yeah. And maybe the people of that time can't attach themselves with it because they're too deep into whatever it is that they're into. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if they're fortunate enough to live long enough, they get to see how their thoughts and opinions have changed. You know what I'm saying? Um... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna take a quick break, and we're gonna wrap this thing up with my man sure. Taylor. talking about uh, how the time will displace our uh, own thoughts and emotions on things. Um, I don't remember what my last thought was because then we got into a whole other conversation <laughs> about something else. But uh, we're just going to move along, man. Uh, what's next for you, bro? What, what, are, what, are your, what are your hopes and dreams as a musician? You know, I know that may be vast, but if they're vast, you know, let them be vast, but... You know what? 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 What's, what's next up for you? I know tomorrow you're playing with Gerard Harris yeah. at the Jazz Showcase. If I get this up before then, go check it out. I'm gonna post about it, so go see it. I'm gonna be there. True. Um, yeah. What's what? What? Who's Jalen gonna be in about five to ten years, man? Yeah, that's 
I don't look that far in the future. All right. <laughs> All right. Six months from now. Yeah. Right, yeah. See, that, that's a little bit more, uh, I can visualize that a right. little better. Uh, I'll be in school, finishing up, um, doing a few uh, shows, well, performances with mm-hmm. Ulysses Owens Jr. He's a great drummer. He's Christian McBride's drummer. Um, so I'll be with him in July in Jacksonville. I think Jack, uh, July 25th. Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, Jacksonville, Florida. And then I'll be with him again in September in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, September one, someday in September, like September 15th, I believe. So depending on how that goes, I might be playing with him more regularly or not. Right. We'll see. Wish me luck. Because <laughs> it will be the first, these are the first two times. So mm-hmm. he's great, great drummer. And I'll be doing things with my own group, uh, Tano, Music Tano, and those dates will pop up as they come in. I'll probably sure. probably September back here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at, and probably as of now, the plan is to start recording an album next uh, December, so December 2019. Okay. So that's a year, like a year and a half from now. Mm-hmm. So. That's the, that's the plan. But we'll see what life has to say about, about some of that. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, man. No doubt, the plans change. Yeah, almost one hundred percent of the yeah. time. Exactly. Might be sooner. Might be later. Right. <laughs> no doubt, man. No doubt. Um, what do you hope to get out of this music thing, dog? Uh, that's a that's a tough question. I don't know. It is, man. I don't necessarily do it for anything other than mm-hmm. I the fact that I like it. Uh. Hopefully be able to support myself first off. Uh, yeah. Food is important. Yeah, exactly. Shelter you know? is also important. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No so, doubt. I guess that's at its simplest form what I hope to get out of it. I mm-hmm. mean, I hope that hopefully someone listens to something that I do and it helps them in some way. You know, that's sure. That's important to me. People like Stefan listening to that music is one of the main reasons I'm doing what I'm doing currently and I think that has helped me <laughs> by inspiring me to be where I'm currently at. Right. So, you know, if I could do that for someone, that that would be dope, even if I never hear about it. You know, so. No doubt. I can dig that, man. All right. I'm not going to hold you up anymore. And plus, we got to get the hell up out of here pretty soon because yeah. the bill's about to close. But uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you guys for listening to Jalen. Be on the lookout for him because he's coming. You know, if you don't know, now you know. And you can, you know, be the first to first album when he posting his tour dates. I'm gonna put the link to his uh, his Facebook the and the Instagram. Web, website's gonna appear right here, JalenBakerMusic.com, right here. I gotta figure out how to do that. I'm, right. gonna, I'm gonna do that so it pop up. Like, yeah, like, no, <laughs> like, subscribe. Yeah, down. <laughs> true, true. We are gonna make it happen. We appreciate it. Um, Jay, thanks, bro. Appreciate, appreciate you, my me. dude. Uh, we family, man. So, oh, yeah. you know, whenever I get the homies on, we can do that. Next time, we got to see if we can get Josh and Deontay on here at the same time. Oh, yeah. And John. Bro. Oh, yeah. That'll we'll, be lit, we'll dude. Get them. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Those little fucking goof troops, man. <laughs> yes. We're going to make it happen. We about to go get something to eat. Hopefully, y'all about to do the same thing. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you.